I'm Mario Tello, and uh, I have the honor to chair uh, this uh, session of the conference cycle uh, in cooperation with uh, so many Ukrainian, uh, so qualified Ukrainian professors. I am taking the food from the Université Libre de Bruxelles Institut d'Etudes Européennes, uh, which uh, I chaired for uh, several years. And uh, I am also a member of the Royal Academy of Science, which is the main sponsor uh, with the Collège Belgique of this uh, conference cycle. Uh, I am very interested to the European institutions uh, widening and deepening. And uh, it's for me a pleasure to have uh, made already some interventions regarding this uh, burning issue. And uh, it is an enormous pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Roman Petrov, the, the speaker uh, of today. Because Roman Petrov is not only an extremely nice person, but is really a, the best we could have. He's a Jean Monnet chair and head of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Kyiv in Ukraine. He's a also an expert of uh, German law uh, and uh, uh, the director of the German Law Institute of the National University of Kiev. And now he's professor in Saarbrücken, so he's uh, uh, fluent in German. After having been uh, in many universities uh, and uh, in the, as a postdoc at the European University in Florence. Uh, Professor Petrov is a, a, an extraordinary a friendly person and uh, is for us a, a pleasure to have a dialogue with him. Uh, I remember just a bi biographical date which can be interesting for the public. Uh, Professor Petrov is uh, based now in Kyiv, but, but uh, uh, his origin is in Donbass. Okay. Uh, he will take the floor for 45 minutes uh, to leave some room for questions and answers. At the end, you, you are uh, free to address questions and about this extremely, extremely important issue of the relation between Ukraine and the European Union and the possible membership. What is not controversial is the total solidarity of the academy and of our university for the Ukrainian people and its uh, resistance against the Russian aggression. Uh, is, I think uh, the, what is more complex and uh, the, that's why we need uh, extremely important academics, uh, expert of law and political science is that uh, is more complex the institutional frame, the legal frame, and the timing of the European Union welcome to Ukraine. Of course, the Ukrainians are already Europeans, and there are many ways to feel Europeans, but we are waiting for tomorrow, tomorrow, the, commission, the European Commission advice on the Ukrainian application uh, as member of the European Union, which is a not only uh, the common uh, identity, the common political belonging, but uh, to be part of a legal structure, which is not, which is not a, a simple club, but is extremely complex institutional construction. The European Council uh, is, uh, has the power to take the final decision and will take uh, unanimous voting procedure to have the final decision. You know, you, we need the unanimous voting procedure in the European Council for every new member. And there are, of course, political, legal, economic, and uh, rule of law implications of this membership, which are complex and will take probably some time to be solved. Not only the Copenhagen criteria, but a series of uh, procedures related to membership. What, uh, what uh, we stress as an uh, expert of the European Union institution is that uh, this uh, application for membership 
is exceptional because it's part also of uh, a fight of the Ukrainians uh, for the European common values. However, it's part of also of a classic issue of political science and European studies, the relation between widening and deepening, enlargement and treaty reform. Always in the history of the European Union, we have had a balance between enlargement and treaty reform. And now, now we are facing a, a similar challenge because I must remember that we have nine applications. We have the Western Balkans waiting in the waiting room since years. We have now the new application by Georgia and Moldova uh, jointly with the Ukrainian application. So the, the question of widening and deepening is uh, in our hearts, uh, particularly here in this uh, city, Brussels, which is the hosting the main uh, European institutions. And what we, we want is a stronger European Union, not a weaker European Union after the enlargement. So uh, I think uh, we have no better choice, no better chance to uh, for uh, introducing this topic than looking at the presentation by Roman Petrov. Roman Petrov, thank you very much for being here. You have the floor. Thank you, prof dear professor. Thank you members of the uh, Belgian Royal Academy for inviting me. It's a great honor. It's my first chance to speak in front of the distinguished audience. And I really appreciate comments by Professor Tello. It's, it's really, he basically outlined all in most important issues, what I was planning to talk about. Um, nevertheless, I want to use this unique chance, not only to tell my personal story, story about Ukraine, to cover the issue of accession, but also I look forward to hearing and reading your questions and to engage in, into um, uh, the deep discussion on the subject matter. Right now, I'm going to upload my presentation and, um, uh, and I will start my presentation um, uh, in the background. So I hope it works and uh, yes. uh, participants can, can see it quite well. So the topic of my talk today is, um, of course, quite um, uh, ambitious because I want to cover two issues at once, which is, of course, what everyone is talking about, the war in Ukraine, and, of course, the fact of Ukraine's accession to the European Union. Is it compatible of incompatible? Because at the same time, in this title, you can see two conflicting issues. On the one way, there is an accession and membership bid, which of course requires long, meticulous work, preparation work, and prolonged negotiations to be sure that a candidate country complies with the whole scope of the EU key and all Copenhagen criteria. However, on the other side, this potential or possibly in few days will learn candidate country is in a state of unprecedented brutal war, which is destroying every day our infrastructure. And uh, as it was um, publicly stated, uh, ends life of at least 200 combatants and possibly same number of civilians every day. So it's a really devastating war. So, my task today is to contemplate whether these two processes can be compatible, whether Ukraine in state of war or after can join the European Union. So I really look forward to hear your opinion and conclusions. Uh, the structure of my talk is the following. I would like, of course, first to share some of my personal impressions and uh, thoughts about the war as well as to provide, to put forward some public uh, views, public um, opinion, and uh, three issues to be considered today, whether the European Union has done everything to prevent the war, 
how second issue, how the European Union is dealing with the war in Ukraine and its economic and trade consequences. And the most important, what are uh, possible roads for Ukraine's uh, membership in the European Union in light of what is going on in, 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 our, in our country. So to start with my personal uh, views, I would like to show uh, to share with you some of the pictures what I took myself in different parts of Ukraine, which hopefully uh, send you and uh, transfer to you the spirit, the feeling of a country in war. And uh, of course, personally, I never thought that I would would I have such an experience, because until the very last moment, despite warning news, despite um, pressing atmosphere around Ukraine and anticipation of the aggression, uh, I'm as academic refused to believe that in modern world, it's possible that decision of one man could lead to such a devastating situation and tragedy, not only in a, within borders of one country, but within the borders and territory of the entire European continent. It's, it's really devastating. And uh, I must admit that personally on the first day of war, when I suddenly in the morning discovered that uh, uh, one person read a lecture and told um, uh, Ukrainians that they don't have, a, don't deserve to be a, an independent country and to, to, to exist as a na nation. Uh, I refuse to believe uh, that as academic, that pragmatism and uh, rationality has right to exist. Basically, you can see that most important decisions uh, which imply lives of thousands of people uh, are not in line with pragmatism and rationality. It's very difficult to comprehend it. Thus, just these decisions are founded on some ambitious uh, aims and objectives, ideological objectives. It's, it's really tragic. And of course, many Ukrainians, possibly all Ukrainians, uh, now understand, started understanding tragedy of World War II even more because it's, it's a kind of a revival of it. Uh, and of course, in a, on a, once war starts, um, everyone immediately reconsiders own values and priorities. Of course, there is no place anymore for material objectives and for, let's say, something like money. Uh, the very important value what you face is safety of your family, of your children, of your uh, compatriots. And uh, from the very beginning, of course, most Ukrainians did everything possible to ensure this safety. And uh, the best uh, and most feasible solution was to bring families to at the border and let them cross the border. So it was the start of a, probably the most massive, most uh, um, um, ambitious refugee crisis which happened um, on the European continent. As we know, as today, there are about 6 million Ukrainians, mainly women and children, who crossed the border and had to seek refuge in the European Union. And um, uh, also another very important conclusion of what we all have uh, done and have faced is the issue of humanitarian assistance. Uh, because really, uh, we can talk a lot about it, but without humanitarian assistance, uh, it would be very difficult, almost impossible for most Ukrainians to survive. Because in addition to eight, uh, six million external refugees, there are about up to 10 million internal refugees. So people had to leave to abandon their properties, their houses, and to move to other, more safer parts of Ukraine. And it's... it's um, it's without humanitarian help, without mutual assistance, it would be impossible 
to fulfill. Uh, and on these pictures, just uh, they are uh, simple pictures, but this nevertheless shows some of this uh, spirit. On your left side, there is one of the cathedrals in the center of Lviv, which is the Western city in, 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 in Ukraine. I also went there with my family and you can see uh, uh, window stained glass of this cathedral covered by protective um, protective screen and it's uh, it shows how people uh, in this tragic time also take care after cultural heritage and city of Lviv of course is a UNESCO site and lots of monuments have been protected this way in the middle there is a very famous monument after Ukrainian uh, hero uh, and it's in Kyiv, and you see how it's being protected from shelling and possible destruction. Uh, and it also gives quite a, a grim view of what's, what's going on. You can see these pictures everywhere. And unfortunately, Ukraine have already lost many museums and cultural heritage places. And on your right side, there is a, a scene from a uh, main station in Lviv. It's a main refugee hub. Most people just arrive. They don't know what to do, where to go. And uh, uh, basically, uh, you can see that um, uh, uh, there is a great mass of people. And the only uh, help for them is the help of volunteers who provide assistance to get at least some seat, drink, and to advise on a further trip. So it's just general. Um, uh, picture of what was common, very common in Ukraine in that days. Uh, when we talk about the public dimension, uh, it uh, I would like to share with you some of my observations. On this picture, you can see quite uh, this uh, this um, views have been already known widely, and today, by the way, the trio of European leaders. Um, including French President Macron, Italian uh, Prime Minister Draghi, and um, uh, German Chancellor Scholz, as well as Romanian President, they went to this same place to visit it and to see the destructions themselves. And it's uh, one of the um, Kiev, Kiev suburban towns uh, used to be comfortable middle class settlements like on a picture below, but uh, invasion changed everything and led to complete destruction and uh, massive human loss and torture. When we talk about uh, public dimension of the war in Ukraine, it must be concluded that um, uh, we are facing unprecedented military, cultural and humanitarian catastrophe since World War II. Indeed, Europe, the European continent, has not experienced yet something similar. Uh, military operation on war started on a scale of a World War II. For example, um, in terms of unit soldiers, uh, it could be compared to the first stage of the Stalingrad battle. And the front line of the entire war invasion war could be compared to the operation Barbarossa front line in World War II. So it's massive. The war is being conducted in the air, in the space, in um, on the earth and under and on water, at water. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a high technology war, uh, but with a great human loss. There are about 30,000 at least um, combatant losses and at least 5,000 civilians just in, in one city of Mariupol, which that had been completely destroyed. Um, when we talk about the humanitarian scale, uh, there are six, the European Commission already states about 7 million refugees, and at least among them, 3 million children and students. For example, I'm an academic at the Kyiv Magila Academy in in Kyiv, and we realized that we are facing very difficult times. We lost many of our students. We lost future students who left uh, abroad, who most likely are going to be settled there, but it's, it's a challenge for us. Some Ukrainian universities have been destroyed. If we talk about the economic scale of the tragedy, 
Before the war, Ukraine was one of the most dynamically evolving European market economy countries with GDP of 165 billion US dollars of size of Hungary. And just over a sudden, it lost everything and uh, direct um, losses already amount to 600 billion US dollars, uh, including uh, loss of infrastructure like airports, roads, refineries, and uh, and other and rail uh, rail stations. So it's 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 a big tragedy, and it will take a long time for Ukraine to recover. It must be admitted. Um, let's uh, try to answer my first question: whether the European um, Union has done everything possible to prevent the war. It's a very difficult question because it's impossible to answer in one way. And I would answer yes and no, because on one hand, the European Union has been doing everything possible to prevent war by restraining Russia, by imposing sanctions, by um, supporting Ukraine, by uh, being um, very strong on uh, preserving and respecting uh, international public law, especially with regard to the annexation of Crimea and stating that um, international law and fundamental principles and values cannot be traded for, tra for trade, for energy. Uh, it's true. However, on the other hand, um, the European Union has always been quite cautious and uh, dubious in its policy towards Russia. For example, if we talk at the evolution of the EU-Russia relations from the time of collapse of the Soviet Union until 2013, it must be remembered that Russia uh, was um, only one post-Soviet country which was recognized as a strategic partner of the European Union. Um, Russia signed, uh, the EU entered into the most advanced at, at that time partnership and cooperation agreement with Russia as well as uh, it offered several tools to ensure Russia's gradual integration into the EU's internal market and uh, a sort of common economic uh, education and uh, legal space. Uh, there were initiatives known like uh, common um, areas of cooperation, agenda for modernization, and so on. Um, Russia even at some stage of Russian history, before Putin came into power, Russia openly confirmed its objective to conclude an association agreement with the European Union. And Russia has seen itself as a, uh, uh, as a very important, essential part of the European continent and European civilization. So there were high hopes to, to set up sustainable and uh, far-reaching relations. At the same time, the European Union never, never ever offered and promised any pr perspective of the EU membership for very pro-European and successful in its democratic reforms, post-Soviet countries like Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. It has always been a bit painful fact that um, the European Union is a uh, um, consistent in avoiding this issue, in even negotiating and promising some, uh, some perspective of the EU membership. Also, the sanctions which were imposed after in, in the aftermath of the annexation of Crimea and invasion in the east of Ukraine, Donbas, were quite limited and restrained. And um, uh, the EU preferred to apply the uh, so-called principled pragmatism with regard to Russia. As well, in addition to it, the European Union and some EU member states, in particular uh, Germany, entered into expensive and not really re reliable and dubious infrastructure projects like uh, North Stream, Stream 1 and 2, which further strengthened a dependency of the European Union um, on Russian energy. Uh, and also Russian propaganda has always been comfortable in the European Union. Channels like Russia Today, Sputnik and others, they have always been um, openly active 
and uh, consolidating pro-Russian support within the EU and promoting Russian propaganda. Uh, so, and also one of the mistakes what the European Union has done, it's a very limited engagement into regional conflicts. For example, in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh and Kazakhstan. So the European Union wasn't visible there. So as the, my conclusion, uh, the European Union had a very bumpy road in relations with Russia. It tried to appease, it tried to cooperate, to engage, at the same time to protect European common values and international law principles. Uh, the next question, how the European Union is dealing with the war in Ukraine and its consequences? Well, uh, of course, I present my own um, position, my own view, and uh, you may disagree with me, but in general, the EU's response immediately after the aggression was swift, swift and resolute. It has been recognized that the, uh, that the war in Ukraine, invasion, is an existential threat for the uh, European Union's DNA. Because once Ukraine loses the war and loses its sovereignty, the threat will just not disappear, but move even closer at the European borders. Uh, the European Union triggered unprecedented packages of its sanctions, restrictive measures against Russia. So far today, there are six packages and the seventh package in the pipeline. Basically, the European Union employed the full potential uh, of its restrictive measures from freezing personal assets to banning trade uh, in crude oil and potentially um, uh, gas. It, uh, as we all know, the six package has not been fully successful because some EU member states have blocked it. So it's impossible, we, it was realized it's virtually impossible to complete, to, to stop flow of um, Russian energy and uh, to pay in return because the dependency is already too high and too threatening. Next. Um, the European Union has been dealing and very successfully dealing with the uh, huge refugee flow of refugees from Ukraine. And the uh, EU directive on temporary protection has been triggered and it really provided excellent support for Ukrainians who left the country. For example, including my family, I also sent my wife and children to the EU, and my, I must admit that the EU countries like Poland, Germany, Italy, uh, Belgium, I have quite a few friends of mine who left, uh, who ended up in Belgium, uh, have enjoyed marvelous treatment and support, not only from the governments, but from people around. And uh, I must say that the EU managed to set up certain golden standard of uh, treating refugees of war. However, we must understand, and I've already heard voices that uh, other refugees are not happy about it. They consider it as a sort of discrimination in treatment. And of course, it's a very complicated issue, I must admit. However, all Ukrainians, especially men at the front line, they are really thankful that um, they can, uh, uh, they're sure that their families in safe hands, let's say. Uh, there also talks about possible Marshall plan for Ukraine, plan for recovery. I would rather call this plan Michel plan after the current European uh, Council president. There are really high hopes. However, from a legal point of view, it's still not clear where money are going to come from whether it would be possible to use frozen Russian sovereign assets. So it's a still issue to clarify from a legal point of view. And strategically, uh, the European Union has changed. Now it has significantly enhanced its defense and security policy, while instruments like strategic compass and peace facility uh, and um, basically, we can now admit that the European Union today, in terms of its uh, common defense and security policy, is different than it was just a year ago. And as an evidence, I would like to cite certain recent statements by the EU top officials. High Representative Borrell recently said, the EU must be a hard power. 
to be a soft power. And um, uh, President Michel recently said just a week ago, if we want to be a geopolitical power, we must act as a geopolitical power. Uh, so, and we must use power to protect our values. So it's, it's really remarkable how rhetoric and tone has changed. And the European Union finally admitted that it cannot anymore enjoy a comfortable seat of a global soft power. It must be definitely supported by hard power. So uh, let's also try to explore other issues, other questions. Uh, namely, one of them is what the European Union can do to prevent further wars in Ukraine and uh, um, on the European continent. Um, my presumption that the war, unfortunately, was a war in Ukraine is not the last, probably the first serious war after World War II, but not last. Certainly, the European Union is going to face civil conflicts, revisionist movements, terrorism, and extremism, cyber and hybrid warfare. Especially hybrid warfare is the most dangerous, as we have seen in Donbass and in Ukraine. It's actually how it, it all started. There is also Article 21 of the Treaty on European Union as a guidance, as a um, uh, formula for EU external policy. It says uh, that the European Union is going to develop relations only with countries, organizations which share common values and international law principles. Certainly it's a challenge in time when the European Union needs to set up relations with countries like China, uh, yesterday, it was an energy agreement with Egypt and other countries with a, with a quite questionable record in human rights and common values. And the big question whether the EU is going to be strong in uh, applying this article or will, be, will follow the principle of pragmatism. There is also a need to revise policy towards Russia. Right now, uh, relations between Russia and EU are guided by five principles, so-called principles, which uh, are unfortunately proved not to be workable. They were ignored by the Russian side. So certainly it's going to take a, quite an intellectual uh, effort to develop new policy, new strategy, which could help possibly, possibly to build relations with new Russia. Also, the European Union, in order to prevent further wars, must be more visible on international scene and to show itself as effective mediator and peacemaker in regional and neighboring areas. Like, for example, now it uh, started active policy in the Caucasian region, in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh, and it, I think it's a good step forward. Uh, next. Uh, regional and international uh, rule bre breakers must be immediately punished and deterred, and the European Union need to be consistent on this issue, as well as to develop new forms of security cooperation. So these are possible ways to, um, to prevent further wars. And now I would like to move to the issue which probably now in the air and uh, very and is going to define the face uh, of uh, future face of the European Union. Uh, namely, I would like to talk about quite a bold step which was taken by the Ukrainian government by President Zelensky on the very last day of February. Uh, just to give you a feeling, it, uh, it happened unexpectedly. All academics, including myself, were curious whether Ukraine would ever officially apply for the membership. But it was done unexpectedly in a tragic circumstances when enemy, the enemy tanks were just 15 kilometers from the residence of president of Ukraine. And in these circumstances, he signed and submitted a formal application for the EU membership. And uh, as we all know, the European Commission, the European Union has accepted this application along with Moldova and Georgia. And um, uh, the European Commission is now working on its report, which will define whether Ukraine, as well as Moldova and Georgia, are going to be given candidate countries, country status 
and will start the negotiation procedure. Uh, so it's a, it's a truly historical moment. However, I call you to, uh, to consider that um, the issue of the future peace deal between Ukraine and Russia is inevitable part of this process. I think that without a peace deal, we cannot seriously talk about the accession because never ever in European history, a fighting country um, being engaged into brutal war can, could conduct simultaneously successfully the accession negotiation and to be qualified for as a EU member state. So basically my presumption that current fate of the European future of Ukraine is being decided on the battlefield. And the peace deal is inevitable, it, it's going to happen. And hopefully the European Union is going to uh, provide successful mediation, not on expense of in Ukrainian interests. And I would like to speculate uh, in front of my audience and to propose several options of the peace deal and how this peace deal is going to impact the Ukraine's accession to the European Union. So I would like to put forward four options for your consideration. Option number one, complete military victory of, for Ukraine. It could happen in case when um, um, European and international support, financial and uh, uh, military equipment support is overwhelming. Uh, and uh, Ukraine would eventually be able to overcome Russian aggression. And uh, in this case, as a consequence of this solution, all occupied territories of Ukraine, including Crimea and Donbas, could be liberated. Uh, most likely regime in Russia is changed because um, current regime would never ever uh, sustain any sort of defeat. And the Marshall Plan for Ukraine could work, and consequently, NATO and EU accession process are quite feasible and could be conducted. Option number two, uh, military victory for Ukraine, but on uh, lesser terms. It's uh, well, or, or it's all when only newly occupied territories. And I would like to remind that currently about um, uh, Twenty percent of the Ukrainian territory is being occupied, among which ten percent can, can be considered as uh, newly occupied territories. Um, and um, the result of this peace deal would be re to reclaim uh, Ukrainian borders as it was on February twenty third this year. Most likely, this, in this option, uh, the regime in Russia is going to to be changed because it would mean, mean a military defeat. And uh, the EU accession is feasible, but such kind of a peace could come on uh, terms of uh, uh, actually um, rejecting um, and uh, putting on hold the NATO membership. So Ukraine, had probably it was one of the pretexts of the war invasion that Ukraine never ever join a defensive Western bloc. Option number three so-called military draw on the battlefield when neither of the parties can afford further progress. Uh, and it would imply that there is going to be no uh, liberation of occupied territories for Ukraine. Borders will be fixed on the front line as they are at the time of the peace deal. Of course, most likely there is going to be no NATO membership and Ukraine would sacrifice it. Uh, and there's going to be a big question mark over the EU accession um, because uh, Russian side could also insist on blocking it. And it would be a big challenge for the EU to consider uh, how Ukraine can progress in the accession having uh, such a significant chunk of its territory occupied. How to do, to deal with this territory? Because technically, these territories are populated by Ukrainian nationals, who at the same time, either forcefully or willingly given Russian citizenship or citizenship of non-recognized entities. 
So it's option number three. And option number four, most um, undesirable for Ukraine. It's a military victory for Russia, possibly as a result of usage of weapon of mass destruction, which most likely would lead to a cessation of all possible uh, military and financial assistance from the West and immediate plea for peace. And um, uh, it would imply, of course, considerable change of borders of Ukraine with possible um, flee of the government into exile and the blockage of the NATO EU accession. And uh, this option is the most difficult because it would be hardly to, um, uh, to foresee the EU accession of a country with undefined borders and crippled economy and uh, um, and government which could not be yet in control of, of the territory. So it's going to be the worst solution. So these are four options, which uh, of course, uh, quite it's a um, mere speculation and uh, for, for academic purposes. So what are the issues uh, to summarize um, of, um, of the peace deal? How peace deal is going to influence the accession. What are the main issues to focus on? First, uh, it must be recognized that the Russia-Ukraine peace deal is going to define limits of, of Ukraine's sovereignty regarding its security and neutrality and ability to enter into defensive unions and integration projects. So regard, depend, depending on an outcome, on an option, what options what I've just listed. Ukraine as uh, a peace deal is going to either confirm Ukraine's full sovereignty or significantly limit it by preventing Ukraine to join any defensive union, Western defensive union, uh, and to join the European Union. For example, recently Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia Lavrov, he openly said that the Russian Federation is against Ukraine joining the European Union because it's slowly, gradually becoming a defensive union. Quite interesting statement. Next, the peace deal may prevent Ukraine from entering um, uh, into defensive unions, but may uh, or may not allow EU membership. So in this case, what are uh, the credible alternatives for the EU memberships for Ukraine? Uh, and it's most sensitive issue for Ukraine now because um, uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian government rejects any alternatives. There were remarks, for example, from French President Macron, who proposed uh, so-called European political community uh, as a kind of a transition hub for, um, for the future accession countries. Or there were also plans to introduce neighborhood economic um, free trade area. So there are different options, including some competitive uh, options uh, put forward by Polish and British governments, like a um, uh, triangle between Poland, Great Britain, and Ukraine on issues of defense, security, and trade. So whether these projects could be a substitution uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very um, important issue to, to, to be discussed, but of course, it will of co imply the results of the warfare on the battlefield, it must be admitted. So the next challenge, the peace deal will certainly define as the territorial status of Crimean Donbas, as well as newly occupied Ukrainian territories. And um, uh, there is already discussion that even the, one of the EU uh, commissars stated that, well, the European Union already has an experience dealing with country, uh, namely Cyprus, which uh, hosts unrecognized entity on its territory, and it's fine. But it must be admitted that the case of Ukraine is uh, completely different because non-recognized territories, and they exist not only in Ukraine, but also in uh, Moldova and Georgia, they're very close to brutal regimes 
with a consistent, consistent violation of human rights. And just lately, we've seen that um, uh, groups of prisoners of war of, uh, with the EU nationalities were put on trial in these uh, entities with the perspective to impose um, a death penalty. So you see, they have been used as a tool in, a, in, a, in politics and to punish people. So it's going to be a big challenge. And uh, uh, last but not least, is the puzzle of the EU membership application on behalf of Ukraine and so-called special accession procedure for Ukraine. There has been already a quite intensive academic debate on the so-called fast track procedure for Ukraine. And there is, of course, a challenge which we are going to face because on one hand, Ukraine um, being uh, uh, shedding its uh, blood for, um, for European common values, expecting special treatment. Uh, and um, this treatment could be different, either a speeding up procedure like it's been taking place now, uh, or um, sort of tolerating some, um, some uh, um, non-compliance with Copenhagen criteria. But on the other hand, uh, the EU accession procedure is already settled process, which cannot be ignored. And uh, we all know example of Hungary and Poland, which uh, joined the European Union, but later allowed it some back, uh, back up in, uh, in their preservation of human rights and European common values. So certainly the European Union shouldn't make the same mistake with uh, regard to Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. So I see that um, uh, time, I'm trying to be on time and to follow the uh, time limit. And I hope uh, there are quite a few interesting issues to be discussed with the distinguished audience, which uh, will highlight, have been highlighted uh, in my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I give floor.